Hi, this is Sheb Varghese. Welcome to the Faith Colloquium podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Josh Swamidas. Uh, Dr. Swamidas earned his MD and his PhD at uh, the University of California, Irvine, and he's a professor of biomedical engineering, pathology, and immunology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And today we're talking about Dr. Swamidas's book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprise Science of Universal Ancestry. Uh, Dr. Swamidas, thank you for talking with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to, great to talk to you. Of course. Um, so maybe you could begin by sharing uh, the journey from uh, maybe the understanding of cre the creation narrative that you were taught or you were raised in um, and kind of take us to what prompted you to want to write this book about um, the historical Adam. Yeah, so I was raised a young earth creationist. Uh, I was Indian and my parents were Indian. It wasn't quite like American young earth creationism. It was just, you know, we read scripture and that's just what it seemed to show. And obviously that's in conflict. That story of origins is conflict with what I started learning from science as a science student and ultimately became a science professor. Uh, and for me, I think there was three key steps involved in really changing my mind on this. One is really understanding scripture for myself instead of what people told me what scripture said is reading it for myself and seeing what it said and finding out that it wasn't nearly as open and shut a case for young earth creationism as i thought and in fact there was a lot of space uh in scripture itself and also in historically how people have read uh, read genesis so i remember um as a young earth creationist even wondering about you know who cain's wife was and wondering about people outside the garden uh, uh when I read the chapters in like you know Genesis chapter six where it talks about Nephilim and all that, yeah. So you know, and, you know, as I got older, older, I realized too that like, you know, Scripture doesn't actually teach that everything was made out of nothing, and it says that the land and the sea made the made you know plants and animals in response to God's call, but it was the land and the sea doing it. So that that that, that sounds you know even with a very literal interpretation, quite a bit like like evolution. Hmm. Now, so part of it was realizing, you know, that that's, that's you know, that, that a lot of the conflicts there were, were really not about what Scripture said. It's about what men said about Scripture. Hmm. And so, so if I let go of a man's word and take a hold of God's word, it really isn't much of a problem. That's one piece of it. Um, the second piece of it is uh, really seeing the science for myself. And so, you know, one of the privileges of being actually... A, you know, a science student and then becoming professors, I didn't have to take other people's words for it. I, I got to see it myself. The human genome was sequenced uh, when I graduated from undergrad. Uh, the chimpanzee genome was sequenced in 2005 when I was in my PhD. And it's really, you know, really when all of that genetic information started to become clear, it really closed a lot of loopholes. And it really seems like, you know, there's just a massive amount of quantitative data that the only really game in time right in town right now for explaining it is uh, common descent. Uh, I mean, I and I knew about intelligent design and young earth creationism, but they didn't really give an explanation of the data that I was seeing. So those were those two things, but it still wasn't enough because uh, I think the the third piece really was, you know, this question about what my loyalties were, and. I really had been raised in a very anti-evolutionist sort of way, mm. and uh, and it was really threatening to lay down that anti-evolutionism. Mm. Uh, in some ways, um, whether explicitly or not, the way how I felt I built confidence in my faith was by showing that evolution was false. That's how I knew that it was worth being a Christian. But the thing about it is that that's really bad theology. <laughs> And frankly, that's a type of idolatry if you want to get down to it, because mm -hmm. there's only one cornerstone, and it's not anti-evolutionism, it's not rejection of evolution. The cornerstone of our faith is not what man does to reveal God through arguments from science, but what God did in history to reveal himself to us by raising this man, Jesus, from the dead. Mm -hmm. And when I really return to Jesus as the cornerstone, you know, it you know, I was able to lay down my anti-evolution idols and follow him. Hmm. Hmm. Um, and then you wrote this book. Uh, so uh, can you share a little bit about like why uh, you chose to write this book about the historical Adam, which is takes a kind of unusual 
um, hypothesis, I suppose. Yeah, well, you know, I told you like one of the first things was really working out where scripture stood with it. And, and one thing that really puzzled me over the years is how everyone was so convinced that there was a conflict between evolutionary science and uh, the story of Adam and Eve. Hmm. And, you know, I looked all over. I couldn't find that clear evidence. Hmm. And the more and more I studied it, the more and more, uh, you know, potential contradictions and, and, and problems really just started to evaporate. And I was just really surprised to see, uh, you know, even you know, several scientists, obviously atheists, but also Christian scientists, really, you know, pressing this idea that, that evolution uh, really overturns a traditional uh, understanding of Genesis with traditional yeah. theology. And, you know, it would be fine if that was true, if that was really true, what the evidence showed or what science seemed to say. I, I mean, I think that we need to let science have autonomy. I mean, it's not the whole story, but let it be. But that's yeah. not even what it says. And yeah. so I, I was really concerned about that. And I was really concerned that even when some people found out that what they were saying wasn't actually true, they still kept on saying it. Yeah. So um, it's really because of that, I really felt honestly forced into a situation where I really had to write this book. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, there are people who I know, um, Christians who I know, who have argued very confidently that, you know, oh, now we know there wasn't a historical atom based upon evolution and, and DNA and, you know, work done by Biologos folks and things like that, um, which I always found sort of underwhelming or overly ambitious um, and just thought, even even granting all of that, how does that, how does that necessarily rule out of historical atom again. Yeah, that, was exactly the, that, that was exactly the point. So the key thing here is that what I'm doing is not actually apologetics in the sense that I'm actually not defending a view. This is actually mm -hmm. a, like a scientific contribution. I'm not saying that Adam and Eve really existed. I'm just saying that this claim yeah. that science shows that they did not is totally overblown. Yeah. And in fact, it's not even good science. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's notable that atheists have really endorsed the legitimacy of the science in this book. And it's also notable that, you know, you mentioned Biologos, they've very recently started a process of acknowledging that they really had the science wrong. Okay. They, they, had, they have quite a bit that they got wrong. Um, they have a lot more to, uh, to, to, to clarify, but in January, and then also, um, you know, last or earlier this month, actually, they they published articles acknowledging they'd really, you know, made some mistakes here. Hmm. It's good that that they're starting to clarify that. I think, like I said, there's a long way to go. But they wouldn't do that if it was uh, if it wasn't good science. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a few years ago, Dennis Venema, I think that's how you pronounce his name, um, and Scott McKnight, they wrote this book. Uh, they got some a fair amount of attention about the historical atom and is, I essentially was arguing, look, there's no way that all the humans on the planet today could trace their ancestry back to a single pair. Um, and that, that book seemed to really shoot the idea of historical atom uh, down. Uh, but you feel like there's something wrong with that argument. Oh, it's beyond wrong. I mean, like his, <laughs> his book. So that book is is into two into two sections. It's really interesting that the subtitle is "Reading Scripture After Science." Hmm. That's extremely disturbing. That's not how you're supposed to read scripture. Hmm. Um, and the book is set up so the very first half of the book is science, um, and then and then there's a theology that basically kind of takes the science as granted and goes from there, and. You know, there's no dialogue in that book, really. It's really, you know, the scientist speaks and the theologian, you know, adjusts. It's mm. disturbing mm. if that's really what it's supposed to be. Especially because what uh, Dennis wrote about Adam and Eve wasn't even good science. Hmm. It's If you look at his arguments against science, every single one of them uh, just isn't, it's just not true. And so that, that that's that's the concerning part about it. Um, so when there isn't an actual dialogue, you know, uh, he, you know, stuff that's, you know, you know, approaching pseudoscience can really just be, you know, accepted. I, I think it passed off as mainstream science because it, it probably satisfied and and um, it was aligned with a lot of the prejudices that people have. Yeah. Um, 
you know, against literalism or with Christians. I'm not even saying that literalism is the right way to read scripture. I mean, I'm just saying that science doesn't tell us. Even if yeah. you take a literal view, science doesn't rule that out. So that's yeah. not a valid reason to rule out a, a literal interpretation of Genesis. It's a not a, it's not a valid reason to to reject evolution either. I mean, it cuts both mm. ways, right? Yeah, yeah. And so it, I think that's that's what's really unsettling about this book for a lot of people because it really does shift the lines of the debate. There's a large number of people who are well-meaning and thoughtful um, you know, uh, you know, traditionalists who have rejected evolution because it was against what their honest understanding of scripture was. And now I think that they have to revisit that. Hmm. And say, well, you know, really, is there something in conflict? Yeah. There's been a lot of people that have abandoned traditional theology as Christians and, and, you know, they probably made a lot of those revisions too soon. And, yeah. and, um, and not only that, they, a lot of them were really wielding, you know this wedge of evolution around and 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 i think and i think it's going to be a little bit humbling to realize that you know as like the defenders of science maybe they didn't actually have the science right yeah and you know and i'll say too that you know there's also atheists that are part of the conversation too that you know they they've been convinced that that genesis is all nonsense but you know maybe, maybe it is i'm, I'm not, <laughs> i can't tell you that but certainly mm. not for the reasons that they've given right yeah and that matters. So I, yeah. think, I think it really undoes a lot of subtle points of view that really have to be reworked now. Yeah. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so in, in your book, you make this distinction between genetic ancestry and genealogical ancestry. Could you kind of flesh out the differences between those two? Yeah. So the first uh, way, well, so the thing about it is when we talk about genetic and genealogical ancestry in our modern context uh, in the genetic age, we're just conditioned to think that they're the same thing, hmm. but they're different. Um, this is the, the fundamental scientific error at play. So it turns out that, um, that genetics is about DNA, but DNA we only discovered like, you know, less than a hundred years ago, really. Yeah. Um, and scripture doesn't talk about DNA. Period. Right. Yeah. It, it just doesn't talk about DNA. Yeah. So, and like historical contemplation, even when it uses the word genetic, that's kind of like a transliteration of like Latin words and things like that. It's not actually meaning DNA, right? Right, right. And that's fundamentally important. When it talks about inheritance, it's not talking about genetic inheritance. <laughs> right. <laughs> And like, I mean, these seem like very obvious statements yet, um, even just like, you know, um, a year ago, or even now, I would say, a lot of people are not clearly keeping things, these things separate. And um, you know, the way it plays out, it becomes very important scientifically. So if you think about yourself, you have parents, and you have grandparents and great-grandparents. All of them are your genealogical ancestors 100%. And mm -hmm. it's like this increasing number going back in time. Now, your genetic ancestors, it's a little more interesting, what's in complex and weird. Um, you would never guess that this is the way it works, um, you know, from, you know, like an ancient understanding of biology. But it turns out that your parents are only 50% your genetic ancestors. Your grandparents are only 25, and it goes down. And just, just about like 15 generations back, 300 years, just 300 years back, it turns out the majority of your ancestors don't actually give you any DNA. Mm -hmm. And that's so, surprising. So I get 50% of my DNA from my mom, 50% of my DNA from my dad, and then like and 25 from my grandparents. Is that, yeah, is that yeah. right? Then yeah. Then, okay. one, then one eighth, one sixteenth, okay. one third second. Okay. Then it very, it's like exponentially decaying, but very quickly gets to the point that a couple people, will, well, not a couple, a few people will give you DNA. That would be your answer. So a few of your answers will give you DNA about 300 years back, um, but the majority of them don't. Okay. And then if you go back a thousand, two thousand, six thousand years ago, the vast majority of your ancestors are genetic ghosts that don't huh. have any DNA. And uh, so that means that Adam and Eve, uh, if you work this out, and this has also been known, I would say, since at least 2004. Uh, so it's been for a while, actually, we've known this. And I get into some of the history here, too. But uh, if you go back that far, you know, it turns out the vast majority of, of your ancestors don't give you any DNA, but also there's a lot of people out there um, 6,000 years ago from whom we all descend. Hmm. 
and it's they're not confined to just to one location like Africa. They're, they're across the globe, including the Middle East. Okay. And so if you kind of turn it around and look it up from the scriptural narrative point of view, um, you know, all that stuff that I was wondering about as a young earth creationist, not because of evolution, but just because of scripture. And also, you know, you can see that speculation going back 2000 years in, you know, the Genesis tradition of just wondering about people outside the garden. Uh huh. And that's the only way then that, you know, that evolution presses on traditional theology by saying, you know, there was something that we wondered about and was a mystery in the past, but now yeah. we have really good evidence that there were people outside yeah. not who scripture was talking about. So they're about as relevant as intelligent aliens if we ever found them on another planet to mm. as a threat to theology. But there's a whole bunch of really interesting questions that arise in theology to engage. Yeah. And that's where we should be having our fun engaging. Yeah. So I, th- I think, um, tell me if this is fair, that this is where you've gotten some pushback, um, like regarding this group of, of people, if, if that's the right term, this group of people who are sort of outside of the garden who aren't descended from Adam and Eve. Um, well, that... I got pushback from all over the place. <laughs> what's going on here is that there's like yeah. entrenched positions. Yeah. People are talking to one another. Uh huh. And I'm in the no man's land <laughs> trenches. And yeah. you know, so people think you're a threat. And so yeah, yeah. Have to. And, yeah. And it's been interesting, actually, that most of the critique hasn't actually been based on stuff that is actually true to what I've written. Okay. <laughs> it's been entertaining to see that play out. <laughs> um, do you think do you think that that concern is is um, warranted or what what do you make of that? The, the one about... warranted if you look at how it's written. So in a great example, uh, as a friend of mine, Hans Madume, who wrote, the, yeah. uh, uh, wrote a review in the Gospel Coalition. Yeah. And if you'll see, he's really inconsistent in his use of the word human. And you'll notice, too, that I didn't say humans outside the garden. <laughs> hmm. Now, you know, Hans is a young earth creationist. I, mean, I like him. He has a narrative in his head that, you know, the way how it works, he even writes it down in that article, is that, you know, well, you know, science makes its demands and then theology just has to capitulate to it. Well, that's all great for that narrative. That's probably true in the past, but that's exactly the opposite of what's happening here. It's really because uh, I took questions from theology seriously that there was a big pushback on the science. Hmm. And um, and so it's really strange to see uh, that as a valid critique. I mean, I, I can't accept that as a valid critique. Hmm. Um, and then also, you know, it's it's interesting too. He criticized. He says he said his strongest criticism. He said his most weighty criticism is that um, that uh, I'm not using the traditional definition of human of Adam and Eve and their descendants, which is incredibly ironic because that's precisely like literally almost word for word the definition of human that I put forward in the book. Hmm. And so, actually, he's arguing for the view I put. What he's struggling with is the idea of people outside the garden, and he doesn't have a category for it yet. And that's a struggle he's working through, and he has to work through, because there isn't good textual basis for rejecting rational souls or people that that look like us outside the garden. There Mm. just isn't there. And scripture just doesn't talk about them. And so they're just a different category that he hasn't thought about. They're not less human than us. They're not subhuman. I'm not calling them beasts. They have rational minds. God could, and I would say does care about them. Okay. It's just not the topic of scripture. The way how scripture defines humans is Adam and Eve and their descendants, which includes all of us across the globe, to be clear. Uh huh. And the reason why he doesn't mention these people outside the garden, but has hints is because, you know, they probably existed. But, you know, scripture wasn't given to them. It was given to us. They don't really exist anymore. There are ancestors in the distance past, but all of us now are descendants of Adam and Eve. Okay. So, you know, he can, you know, of course, he can object to that, but certainly not on the grounds he's raised. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, he can object to the fact that there's humans outside the garden when I have actually shown him that there doesn't have to be humans outside the garden. Okay. He can't object to this because I haven't adopted the traditional definition of human when I actually have. Like, that's not coherent. Okay. Um, so, if I'm understanding correctly, so um, you would argue that these uh, people who are not human, who are outside of the garden, those folks could have uh, shown up through the 
I guess, normal processes of evolution. But Adam and Eve could have been like the special, special creation creation. of God. Is that right? Yeah, I think the language here is important because it can create confusion, right? So I say people out to the garden for a reason. Um, I don't call them human, but I think in, by in many ways they would be. Like if you saw them today, they would they'd be biologically human. Okay. They'd be reproductively compatible with us. They should have human rights and dignity. Okay. They're not animals. They're not beasts. Okay. They, they're not soulless necessarily, and I certainly don't think they're soulless. Okay. They're 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 people. Uh, okay. They're just not the people to whom scripture refers. So what okay. I'd say is that in a technical sense, when we're talking about human is how scripture and traditional theology have defined it in the past. That's the humans that are the Adam and Eve and their descendants. And part of it is going to also relate to what actually is it that God was doing with Adam and Eve when he created them. So I think when you look at Genesis, I think what you see is that God creates a world that's good, but it's not perfect. In Genesis 1. And then as as part of a move to make things perfect, God kind of creates an opportunity for a death-free existence by making this perfect garden with the tree of life. Outside the garden, we find out in Genesis 3, it has death outside. That's the literal mm-hmm. teaching of Genesis. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you, if you reject that, you're rejecting what Scripture teaches in Genesis 3, that there was death outside the garden. The garden was a mm-hmm. defined place that had borders. It was because it had access to the tree of life that they were free of death. Hmm. But so I think that starts to give us a really clue of what's going on is that maybe God made people across the globe and it was good, but God wanted to make it better uh, by giving them a death free, morally perfect existence an opportunity for that. Hmm. But that's precisely where Adam fails, right? And where Adam fails is where Jesus succeeds. So when you have that narrative in the background, right? And, and, and to be clear, I mean, I'm drawing on, you know, theologians from all, uh, you know, I mean, conservative theologians who have, have actually worked out a lot of these pieces long before I even entered the scene too, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Seth Postel and, and John Salehammer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And all of that, um, all of that stuff about how Genesis is working in the Pentateuch and the, and the compositional view that they take. Yeah. That's a really strong view, right? And then, you know, the idea that how Adam is an architect of Israel, right? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and so, um, now some people will take that too far, I think, to say that because he's an archetype of Israel, that means he doesn't exist. That's, yeah. that doesn't that doesn't follow. People can be yeah. archetypes and be real at the same time, right? <laughs> right, right, right. And so there's like a logical flaw there of right. like an excluded, I mean, like a false dilemma, right? Right, right. So I'm not going that far, and neither did Seth Postel or John Salehammer. I mean, you could also talk to, uh, look at Greg Beal, uh, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, he talks about this, too. Um, and really seeing that, you know, that God creates the entire world, but in the same way how, um, you know, Israel was a chosen, were, were his chosen people, and he dwelt, I mean, he's omnipresent, he's present everywhere, but he was in a special way in the temple, in the most holy of holies, right? Mm. And in the same way, you can see that same structure arise in in the Genesis Garden, where the garden mm. really looks like the Holy of Holies, where, yeah. where there's a space where you have to be morally perfect or you'll die. <laughs> huh. And if you're not, you have to be cast out. And, uh, and, and so Adam and Eve, they're really exiled. And in their exile, we're all, we all lose our chance to, to live in the death-free garden, too. Yeah, um, and so yeah. yeah, so I think you can really easily see how Adam's fall leads to, you know, the groaning of all creation. Right. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't death. I mean, this also is a, a really interesting point too. So one objection that some people raise is is the problem of death outside the garden before the fall. Now it's important to understand historically how that arises. Um, if you go before the Protestant Reformation, that was at best a minority view, but in reality, it was it was a derided view by Augustine, for example. Hmm. He says uh, that the fact that people would even think that there was no animal death before the fall is evidence that they're fallen people. Uh huh. Yeah. And it's it's interesting that the way it was re- revived, young earth creationism with the no death before the fall view actually arises up at the same time evolution does in a rump movement, uh, Seventh-day Adventists. 
and flood geology. So yeah, um, most people would have thought historically that the Earth was young because they had no reason to think differently. Yeah. But when there seemed to be clear evidence against that, the vast majority of Christians just said, oh, okay, maybe we thought that in the past, but it's just not a big deal. And they moved on to thinking about an old Earth. Uh -huh. And there were a bunch of flood geologists that decided to really stake their claim there. Now, there's a couple things that they did where they deviated in a very big, from a big way from majority of Christianity. One is they had their own text from Mary Eddy Baker. <laughs> Um, second is they stopped celebrating church on Sunday and moved it to Saturday. Mm -hmm. That's part of the reason why the six days become really critically important to them. Mm -hmm. And then also they became vegetarians because they were, at least they were consistent to mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. Said, you know, if we're going to take literally this idea that God's good, perfect creation means that there was no death before the fall, you know, if we're going to be Christians looking forward to that, yeah, God temporarily allowed eating animals in, in Genesis in the same way how Moses allowed, you know, divorce, you know, a good world wouldn't have animal death. And so they start to live, you know, I mean, you're Indian, right? They start to live a bit like, you know, <laughs> you know, those Indians that will like, you know, not eat meat, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I'll give them credit for being consistent, right? Yeah. But so that was a very rough movement for about 100 years. And it's only really in 1960 with the publication uh, of the Genesis flood. Um, by Henry Morris and Whitcomb, where, um, and then they drew strongly on uh, Seventh day Adventists. That's okay. actually how, um, you know, the scientific version of Yak. And to be clear, like, you know, there's a lot of young earth creationists in India, where we're from, but they're yeah. not scientific Yaks, right? <laughs> right, right. Uh -huh. And it's not, it's not as charged for them. And often they're not even anti evolution. It's just that's kind of where they read scripture and where they came to, right? Right, yeah. They're not contemplated. In contrast, what's going on in the 1960s is that it's a very like it's a very honed, scientifically oriented, yeah, evolutionist oriented, and also pitting it as a foundation of the faith oriented right um, version of Yak, which is a complete, complete departure from Christian tradition. Yeah, and so so that's the tradition basically out of yeah. which people say we cannot tolerate death outside the garden for animals and that is remarkable because that is actually directly in con in contradiction with a literal reading of genesis mm. and so if you're going to take that view because you're a part of that tradition that's great but let's just not pretend that that's a literal reading of genesis that right that's a departure from a literal reading. Let's also let's yeah. not pretend that that's a traditional reading of the church, capital C. Right. Which historically has rejected that view. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying it's heresy, but to claim that that's a traditional view is just not tenable. Yeah. That's, that, that's yeah. absurd. So, like, if you go to Answers in Genesis and talk and see Ken Ham, they, sure. they're fundamentalists. They're not Seventh-day Adventists, right? Sure. So they kind of took the parts of Seventh-day Adventism that they liked, like the emphasis on the six days... But they didn't like the moving to Saturday thing. Right. <laughs> they liked the polemic against evolution, the no death outside the garden. So they took that. But they didn't like the vegetarianism thing, so they dropped that. Okay. Yeah. And what's really motivating it is is opposition to evolution. And all yeah. of that would be valid if there really was a contradiction with scripture. Yeah. But there isn't. So yeah. what exactly is all that for? Yeah, yeah. Um, right now, uh, as I understand, you're working on a project with William Lane Craig. Could you share, if you can, can you share a little bit about um, what that project is going to be about and how that's coming along? Yeah, so we're in the middle of writing that. My ambitious goal is to be able to submit my draft, submit my draft by the end of summer. We'll see how it goes. We've got a lot of work to do still for it. Okay. I've been uh, really enjoying talking to, to Bill. Um, he really wants to model this off of Dennis Venema and Scott McKnight's book, but, and, but to do it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so instead of science in the beginning, it's really going to be a dialogue between science and theology with, you know, his reading from scripture coming first. Got it. Okay. And I'll be writing the science. He kind of gave me a free hand to do that. Okay. And he takes a different view. Um, remember I told you that, you know, I'm, I'm just explaining that, you know, you know, I, I kind of explore a literal reading in Genesis, but I say, you know, you can still reject, a, you know, a literal reading. I'm fine with that. I'm not trying yeah. to tell you it's the right way. I'm, I'm not an exegete. That you have to right. talk to experts to figure out that. And frankly, yeah. you guys all disagree with each other. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. What I'm trying to be is a servant to the church. So yeah. Bill takes a nearly mythological view of Genesis. <laughs> um, he thinks that Adam and Eve are real, but he doesn't think any of the details there should be read as anything other than myth. Uh huh. 
and he thinks that you know by God's divine inspiration, the early um, you know writers of Scripture um, were correct in saying that Adam and Eve were real, and uh, Adam and Eve though were like maybe five hundred thousand years ago or so. Uh huh. Yeah. Like long before the origin of Homo sapiens. And, yeah. And you know, uh, that's really you know resonates a lot with like the traditions in the Catholic Church, and um, and. It's not the same as, but it connects to some ideas that, for example, reasons to believe and other old earth creationists care about too. Yeah. And it's not necessarily my tradition, but, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist here really in service of the church. And I think that there's also been a lot of things that have been said that are falsely wrong about that view too. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really, you know, trying to kind of clarify what is it really that the evidence demands of us. And I think what we found is this is just a place where there's been a lot of really, um, you know, really bad science put forward as good science and accepted as good science when it really wasn't. Um, you know, and so there's going to be an opportunity to clarify that. I think uh, my book, The Genealogical Adam and Eve, really has uh, turned the conversation upside down. But I would emphasize that that is only part of the story. Yeah. This other book, I think, will do the same. Okay. Yeah, well, that's exciting. Um, do you have any thoughts about? Like where, where you think this conversation will be in maybe 10, 15 years or where this is going? You know, it's hard to tell. Um, yeah. I think that um, my, I can tell you what I would like it to go to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I, 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 I hope that all the current camps are unsettled and they have to rework <laughs> who they are and why. Yeah. And that they kind of come to a place where instead of being entrenched, that they're in better dialogue with one another. Yeah. And um, and they're starting to make space for the differences, and yeah. uh, and that origins stops being a place of contention, but instead it becomes a place of real beauty where we can explore together what it means to be human. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think what's really tragic about the conversation on origins is that um, it's a bruising place. I mean, it's it's like fairly remarkable how uh, cruel to people are in that space and like, yeah. in kind. Yeah. Um, and suspicious and just dis- untrustworthy um, people are. I mean, people don't trust what Christians say about this because we right. have a really poor track record and being honest about science here. Um, and scientists aren't trusted because, frankly, they don't have a good track record either in this space <laughs> at yeah. times. Yeah. And, um, and it, it becomes a really um, contentious internal conversation, which is yeah. not what it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's supposed to be a public conversation where we're engaging grand questions together, not just with other Christians, but also with non-Christians too. Yeah, and that's what it could be in ten years if we want to go there. Yeah, I would. Yeah, that would be great. Um, it 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 saddens me when when particularly when Christians uh, speak about other Christians in this way that like oh you're sort of capitulating to secular liberalism or something like that well it goes both Uh, ways i mean i think a lot of those um a lot of uh evolutionary creationists have had a really hard time with this because i think they're used to being the ones who are correct on the science even though in this case they weren't yeah (laughs) they're also really used to um you know being confident that a non-literal reading of genesis has been shown false by science and right and and that's not true yeah and they, 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 and you know, a lot of them probably, you know, made, you know, revisions to theology for, for reasons that aren't valid. And yeah. so there's going to have to be some revisiting done there. And, you know, I think it's going to be hard for a lot of yeah. them. So yeah. it, it, it's, it's hard on all sides. I'll, yeah. I'll tell you, I mean, I'm sympathetic yeah. and empathetic to them. Right. Well, yeah, I think Christians should really appreciate this book and, and your efforts to try to just say, here's what it is. Let the chips fall where they may. I'll take the heat from wherever I get it. So the book is called The Genealogical Adam and Eve, The Surprising Science of Universal Ancestry. Thanks a lot, Dr. Swamidas, for talking with me. I really appreciate it. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe and please share with your friends. 